So it's been a privilege to have this exhibit on loan uh, from the Ashui Awan Museum and Heritage Center. I am pleased to have Curtis Quam, director of the Heritage Center with us today, and he will be acting as our moderator. Um, he'll tell us first a little bit about the Zuni Map Art Project and then introduce our two artists. So without further ado, Curtis, you're up. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, sorry for the challenges. And again, hopefully this recorded uh, session will uh, be available later on. Uh, but my my name is Curtis Kwong. I My official title is Museum Technician Culture Educator here for the Oshawa Museum and the Heritage Center. I've uh, been with the museum for the past 21 years and have the opportunity to just learn uh, a lot about things to make a Zuni and still keep it up a lot of um, a lot of avenues, a lot of different ways uh, of understanding a lot of our ancestry, our history, um, and all that is with the Ashwin Mapper Project. Um, and first and foremost, uh, giving credit to um, my predecessor, uh, Jimmy Note. Uh, this was actually his, his baby. <laughs> this is something that he's working on for years. Um, and a lot of his life experience has really contributed to the map art and understanding of mapping and how much power map, uh, maps have. Um, and cartography over the years has really taken over um, a lot of imaginary boundaries, a lot of different things that were not from us. And for, I think, a lot of Native people, uh, we definitely have this sense of uh, we don't own the land, that we just take care of it. Uh, so this is an important understanding. And I think a lot of his work was inspired by how we see the land and how landscapes were named uh, appropriately uh, over the world uh, because of the land features and the things that happen within the landscapes. Um, so definitely um, a lot of credit goes to him and starting this project. And thank you for all the funders to all have helped the Map Art Exhibition and really good hosts uh, over the years to have um, over the years. Um, the uh, Ashwa Museum and Heritage Center of Long Time as a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Uh, and during this time, uh, we navigated those waters pretty well. And unfortunately, a lot of things happened um, where uh, we were um, not a nonprofit anymore. And uh, so we are under the Pueblo of Zuni, a tribal museum, which actually is pretty good. So we're now we're uh, supported and backed um, by our tribe. And we really want to start to engage with a lot of our resources and making that available for our community and also our broader community. Um, the Ashwin Map Art Project had been um, in boxes and social years. Uh, one of the things that became very apparent for this project was that um, a lot of our artists and advisors slowly started to either move on in their lives and their career or unfortunately had passed away. Um, we saw this as a really interesting moment in our time and really pushed us to start to work uh, with requests coming in about the map art project and also to request for exhibition. Um, this is the first uh, uh, for us, um, myself and Carvana, uh, to really engage with the map art exhibition um, and literally uh, taking the dust off the cases and checking the paintings and we started to realize how impactful this was. And as we went through the paintings, it wasn't just the art, it was memories that we were going through. And uh, for, for myself, I actually was the project manager for the Map Art Project and helped connect the landscape and art uh, to the artists and advisors, arranging different things and, and really uh, making an uh, understanding of where we are today with this. Um, so. Unfortunately, uh, again, uh, moving on with other things for other people, uh, we just wanted to start engaging with this and making this available for not only us, but for the artists as well. Um, and this, again, moved to where, where it is today. And this whole process is uh, several steps in the, in the beginning. Um, Mallory and Levon can definitely relay their experience from the Map Art Project. Um, this is a unique one. Um, in the beginning, we started with a request for proposals, or RFP was put out for the community and artists. And um, once uh, maybe like this <laughs> session, um, we had some challenges with that. Um, some people were not familiar with the RFP process, and we kind of 
um, friendly, <laughs> encouraged a lot of our artists that are in the community that we knew of and that we were introduced to, uh, to be part of this map art exhibition. So it was a challenge on a lot of different levels. Uh, and we started to engage with this understanding of um, how we wanted Zuni to be represented. Um, and we know we're not the spokespeople for the tribe, but we also know that artists have a unique way of conveying uh, history and culture in such a delicate way, or maybe sometimes that, that uncomfortable position of where we have to understand our history from uh, books and other resources. Um, so this was a really interesting uh, movement. And uh, first and foremost, actually, we got an advisory committee together. There was about a dozen people that were part of this committee. And moving forward with this and understanding what should be mapped and what shouldn't be mapped. Um, what could be inc included on paintings and what should not be on, on paintings. Um, so when this request for proposal went out, um, artists submitted sketches of uh, different themes and different landscapes that were there. Um, I think our, our Levon actually has three paintings in our in our project. Uh, Mallory has one. Um, and this was a whole process. Uh, so once the uh, request was put out, um, we actually had this these sketches that were coming in and then um, the committee would get together and actually start to um, vote um, and calculate a lot of that so it was fair um, and trying to not be biased and impartial, but we are a very close com uh, community, so it was very difficult to make that decision at times. Um, but we saw what we see in the sketches, and sometimes we remove so much that the sketch was basically a finished piece in sometimes our eyes, um, and we wanted to see how far this could go uh, in a very delicate way. So a lot of our advisors, uh, one of them coming up, uh, Octavius was one of our lead advisors, uh, to make sure that things were done appropriately, tastefully, um, that they could create conversations, um, sometimes uncomfortable ones, but again, um, that's something we have to really engage with uh, to understand where our history has come from and where we're going into the future. Um, so once these sketches were put in, the artists would provide a sketch, the committee would go around and we would um, vote on a lot of different things. It was a tally system. Um, whoever had the highest score would actually get the piece. Um, once that was done, um, the artists actually, um, we did our best to make sure that their materials and things were in, in the forefront so they would get a part of part of their payment in the beginning part of it. And from there, uh, there was check-ins. Uh, there was check-ins that would happen um, with artists and advisors to make sure that it was done in, in a very good way um, and things were not um, overextending or beyond the boundaries. And I think actually one of the really good things about Zuni is that since we're a really tight knit uh, community, we already have those sensibilities in place and in mind. Um, so I don't think we had too many um, paintings that or sketches that came in that were insensitive. Um, and we made sure that that was kind of at the forefront and uh, they would check in at, at times. And I think with um, Levant's Vandelier piece, it was just like a continuing addition. Can you add this? Can you add that? And can you add this? And it was really from Oct Octavius and other advisors that had experience on the land. They've been to uh, Bandelier. Um, they've been to places that are normally forbidden, not just from the National Park, but just for us as uh, Zunis. Uh, there's some things that we should not explore. Um, so that was another thing that definitely is a conversation piece within the paintings is there's some things that are not meant for all of us. And I think Mallory can get into that a little bit with her piece um, in a few minutes. So giving um, some idea of how a lot of that worked. Um, and when the finished piece came in, and I remember I was here for all the pieces when they came in and so excited it was like Christmas every time uh, when the, our new artwork came in and uh, these artists and advisors would come together. And I still remember a lot of what the artists had actually uh, conveyed in their artist artwork and um, and it was a really, really intimate time. And I was, I definitely feel like I'm privileged to have been part of that um, because I could hear from the artists themselves, their perspectives. Um, and I'm like the worst at remembering names. <laughs> um, but one of the things that really stuck with me is what they conveyed in their art. Um, every little detail, of course, I didn't get. And there's probably a few things that were not part of the conversation because of the excitement that comes in with bringing in something. Um, and once that came in, 
um, you know, it started this process of, okay, what are we going to do with these? And the first three from uh, Gideon Palouse, uh, the late Ronnie Kachani and Edward Wimaitiwa, uh, were actually produced into posters. Uh, and these posters have place names on them in Zuni uh, that are a gift to um, the school sites here, educational settings, families, and we're still doing that today. Uh, we've actually had a family come in yesterday and they were gifted a set of posters to take with them to their home to learn a little bit more about Zuni and our history and our connection to the land. Um, so it's still being done. Uh, there's also a map art catalog. If um, this is one of them right over here, this is available, I believe, at um, the museum there in Phoenix. So you can actually get a copy if you're interested in learning uh, about that a little more. Um, some really good artist perspectives and advisors. So definitely a really um, good stuff that's there. Um, and a lot of these, we start the posters were made and then from there it's like, okay, where do we put them? So we uh, did a lot of research on the crating and making sure things were uh, taken care of, wrapped in a good way. Um, for the exhibition, as you can see, if you're in that area, uh, a lot of the paintings were left um, un, um, you know, the frames were there, but there was no glass. Um, and I remember being part of this conversation with Jim and others saying, it's like, we, they wanted that natural feel of that. Uh, they didn't want anything to be a barrier behind it because the map art uh, exhibition was really breaking down a lot of that. Um, now, going a couple of years at, um, in time now to now, uh, we're starting to look at this at a different perspective of saying, maybe we should cover these um, because you know, dust and things travel, um, and like Levant's piece, which is watercolor, uh, and that's the only ones that are actually encased uh, in, under glass because it was very fragile. Um, we wanted to make sure that they're um, saved and, and on into as long as we can take them into, uh, because again, the sad reality, some of the artists are not with us today. Um, so those modifications may not be made. Um, so this is one of those things that we're kind of thinking about now. And since we're a new tribal program, uh, we're starting to navigate different things and we're in the midst of a move, the beginning part of it anyway. Uh, so we haven't done anything physically yet, but we are gonna get there. Um, and one of the ideas, and, and we would have loved to have this happen, but, and we still might make it, but we might actually get the map art once it comes back home uh, on display here in Zuni. Um, that's definitely one of my goals <laughs> within a part of this is to have this in Zuni. Um, one of the comments that I actually received on a social media post from one of the artists is it would be great to have them right next to their piece. And I agree totally. Um, so hopefully that happens here in the village because it, it should be here. Um, but we're working with different ways to make this um, uh, accessible. Uh, we have a Google Arts and Culture page um, that we might make this virtual, but right now it's just kind of like a thought. Um, so a lot of uh, opportunities and a lot of different things uh, to happen. There are other resources and references to the map art. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, PBS, there is a documentary series on Native Americans. Um, one of the first um, series of that uh, is actually part of Zuni and part of the map art project. And I remember for the late Dwayne Dish that his painting is the connection down south and researching that a lot uh, online, what I could find and finding these really interesting pyramids and caves uh, that actually wound up on the late Duane Dishta's painting. Um, and now uh, with PBS in that documentary, we actually got to see um, Quetzalcoatl's temple and uh, and it was like amazing to see what they talked about with the, um, the glittery cave that goes into the bottom and a lot of what was found within the bottom of that pyramid. It's really interesting to see that with our own eyes now and we get to this connection an idea of who we are as Zuni people. We're connected to a lot of different places out there. Um, and we're starting to change the vocabulary like Pueblo Grand going into a more of a, a local name. Um, we see a lot of these different things as um, these ancestral sites as an active community, not as a ruin as archaeology has kind of misidentified over the years. And even archaeologists, uh, anthropologists and uh, ethnographers and other people within that field of study are starting to understand that um, and moving towards some really, really good things. Uh, so that's a big spirit of the Map Art Project. And we definitely wanted to come home and we're excited for it to come home and to have that displayed here, but we're also excited to have that out there. 
Uh, there is a lot of um, people that I'm pretty sure have seen this map art and now see the landscape in a different lens. Um, and we definitely take for granted a lot of different things that we see over time. Um, I could convey one thing, uh, our Zuni River has been dry since 1990 and I can, I'm actually one of those things that, uh, and people within the community that can convey that to not only my kids, but others to what it felt like to swim in the Zuni River, to skate there, uh, to fish there. Um, uh, I'm not that old, <laughs> uh, but it's just one of the memories that I have and I'm pretty sure LaVon and Mallory maybe have the same. Um, so it's it's one of those things that while uh, a lot of other things will argue about if water has memory, um, it's a big conversation piece. We definitely know that there is a lot of memories of water and we tried to convey that as much as we could. Um, so that said, <laughs> a little background of the map art. And from here, I think, um, uh, Caitlin, if, if you have, um, I think uh, LaVon had his sketch on there. So I think if we can start with LaVon, uh, maybe we can start with his sketch um, and then going on into his paintings from there. Uh, I will probably ask a couple of questions uh, to LaVon here and there, um, but LaVon, if you're ready, uh, and if his uh, PowerPoint is ready and up in queue, we can share that. So yeah, there you go. So Levan, um, the mic is yours. Hi. Yes. Thank you, Curtis, um, for the introduction. My name is Levan Lancasion, um, and I am uh, one of the participating artists of the Zuni Map Art Project, <clears throat> Ashiri Awa Map Art Project, and um, it, this is a really good opportunity for me to share my uh, artistic process. Okay, so right here we got an image of Sketch Rio Grande Tribes, and it was a part of my initial proposal. And looking back on the whole process was very exciting and interesting. Um, I remember uh, I was trying very, very hard to make it as a working artist and found it very difficult. Um, and so when I found out about the map art project, it was an opportunity to, for me to kind of use the skills and um, kind of the artistic approaches that I had learned in um, going to art school into bringing kind of all the information that was required in the map art <clears throat> and try to convey that into the painting uh, I felt um, I could do because it's kind of similar to what I felt like I was learning at the at school. And at the same time, my own personal interest in, you know, the landscape, uh, the Southwest is filled with so much interest, uh, interest in history, um, the Spanish the introduction of all kinds of technology once the Spanish had shown up, uh, the interactions with Europeans and uh, subsequently the the renaming of all our, you know, uh, place names, uh, I found very interesting. So it kind of hit on a lot of my interests. And, and at the time I was also working on trying to convey my own interpretations of maps and map art. Um, so it was um, a part of my life where all these things came together. So the, the initial part of the the painting um, was try to represent a painting that showed all the real grand pueblos. And so in this sketch, this was kind of my first attempt at trying to compose uh, a painting in which I, I could start to work off of. <clears throat> and it was interesting because the only reference I could find that worked for me was when I would watch the news every night on channel four. The, they would do the news for the weather and they would show a whole picture of New Mexico. And so that's kind of what this uh, sketch is going off of. And in reference to how much more I had to, to incorporate it, incorporate into the painting uh, to, re to reach the requirements for the map art uh, was something I did not know. <clears throat> Um, and in the process, I remember Jim Enote had scheduled a 
um, a flight. It was uh, a small and single engine plane where we flew from Albuquerque all the way to Taos. <clears throat> and it was in that moment where I realized that there was more of a perspective that I would want to have in my painting. And that was the, the bird's eye view perspective. And I think that uh, trip from Albuquerque to Taos with Jim, uh, and I think the pilot was one of his, his friends, I don't remember, but that was uh, an amazing trip. And it seemed to be that that bird's eye view seemed to carry over, over onto the other paintings. But if there was anything that was really influential in trying to find the composition for that first Rio Grande painting, that was it. It was that flight. And um, yes. So this is a close up of the map art. It's more kind of uh, the center strip of the piece. And I remember having this moment where um, a conversations I would have with my professor about how to use line, uh, a certain sense of line could delineate delineate between one scene to the next i think was the conversation and i was working in oil <clears throat> with those paintings and i found that if i use the same approach in these watercolors uh i would be able to convey what i wanted to tell because i feel i felt like there was an enormity amount of information that i had to put in a small amount of space and so this was like the best alternative to try to get that done and i found that it worked for for me in in the watercolor process in the beginning and so you get like these scenes where they're multi-dimensional where one scene splits into another scene that represents usually an important area like a, a dam uh, waterways where there's um, obstruction or you know how dams uh, change the landscape and just kind of those small references to it um, it's interesting to kind of think back to to that time when I was working on it because um, I feel like I always have to immerse myself in the process in order to understand what I'm trying to render and um it's it's um uh, it's harder i think sometimes when it's um i feel like when you're dealing with the map art project i felt like it was art through committee and it's not necessarily i have to rely on my own personal artistic expression i have to um be mindful of what was important to incorporate and mindful of what not to incorporate and so that was really important for me to stick to that parameter and i feel very fortunate to be a part of that process and this is a, a the um, the painting i did of the bandelier national monument and i believe it was the second painting wait was it the second I'm sorry, it's been so long, but my memory of this painting had uh, proposed its own challenges. I think uh, an example of trying to use the idea of line to convey uh, one scene from the next is most evident. And that push and pull between like the background and foreground, I think was one thing I find um, that came about and um unexpectedly and it seemed to work and i have a tendency to use it now in my own work to this day and um i always felt very um challenged by what needed to get represented in the painting and one thing i find really interesting in researching for these paintings is um 
what it was like, you know, I, I go on these moments where I'm caught on a wanderlust, I think, um, just kind of how I, the reason why I became an artist was finding a piece of pottery in the landscape and you're caught in the wanderlust about this anonymous artist who created this pottery long, long, long time ago. And I feel like the map art project was was similar in that the artist is the the conduit or the medium between trying to translate certain bits of bits and pieces of information and then render it into an image uh, like a, a map art for others to understand. And I feel like that was my role in this process or as a, as the artist. And I feel very um, fortunate to to know that I learned how to do that because um, uh, it it was difficult at times. And and yes, and the last painting. This is a watercolor painting of. I believe the Grand Canyon, uh, several different places we had traveled um, to the Grand Canyon. Um, the experience to travel there in itself was uh, an amazing uh, once in a lifetime experience. Uh, and I often have a moments where I think of that time in my place as um, something that happened to me that was really really good and i always reference it as a a place of spiritual strength and i couldn't have imagined that be a, a source of uh, spiritual strength if i hadn't had the opportunity to be a part of the map art project <clears throat> so in the painting uh, um there's a collection of water image and uh people collecting um, there are willow sticks for planting prayer, prayer sticks. So that is the scene to the left. And in that composition, I was trying to make uh, the dynamic movement of water flow and referencing how much information I needed to put in such a small uh, portion of the piece. Uh, I ended up having to comp compose photographs together and um, I think just render them as they were as photographs. And uh, I think for watercolors, uh, I, it presents its own challenges for me uh, versus oils. Um, I feel like sometimes when I work with watercolors, it's easier to have more of a illustrative, illustrative look to them because um, I love to draw drawings the most immediate thing I have, I have learned and um, render and watercolor it's great but the whole meaning and uh, importance of actually going there and being in that space I think was the more important part of trying to render it in a painting um, just like the difference between being on the landscape and doing the painting versus painting a painting from a photograph it's completely different and um being able to be a part of something so uh big and have like so much wonder and magic and power over you spiritually uh it's it leaves a mark and um i've always referenced that point in my life as uh, kind of like a turning point in trying to understand who i am as a zuni and how it's important for me to uh, send that message or carry that message. And um, yes, and thank you for listening. I appreciate, I appreciate it. I'm going to record That was really cool. Um, one of the really cool Things about the map art project, um, we understood, and and Lavon definitely eloquently mentioned. Uh, at every moment, we try to immerse the artist in the surroundings that they were depicting. Um, so in 2010, we actually organized a uh, with funding support, um, uh, organized a trip to, down the Grand Canyon 
Um, so it was a 12 people crew. There were some advisors, part of this, uh, this group, uh, artists and advisors. So I went down in Grand Canyon and we got to experience the Canyon for 14 days and 14 nights. Um, it was a, a surreal experience. I still remember it like, like it was yesterday, um, everything that I experienced and at times how uncomfortable I was, not just being in a place but me, just like the physical comfort of it. Um, being in rowboats and your feet being wet every day, all day almost, uh, and and just hitting the rapids and literally getting splashed with water. Um, and one of the things I definitely heard from Octavius during that time is um, that our that our elders had actually have made the, the and continue to make these cultural monitoring trips um, for to check on these sites that definitely are an important part of our understanding of our landscape and our history. Uh, but coming to these areas, uh, one of the things that I remember him mentioning was um, when the elders would get splashed, uh, splashed by the rapids in the water, um, some of these elders would say, Ulo, matenkla, which really means that they wanted the whole world to be covered with moisture. Uh, I thought that was really, and it still is with me today, that it was, uh, and in the map art, it's the same way. It's, we can only show our perspective um, and our understandings of our history and our culture but this is uh, really hopefully inspiring other tribes to do the same thing. Um, and another thing that was interesting is actually we wanted to be inclusive with uh, trying to balance the male and female understandings of who we are as Zuni people. Uh, and at the time, one of the very prominent uh, female artists, uh, one of the very few at the time was actually Mallory. Um, and we actually gave her one of the hardest challenges that we can think of. Is it's like we have the Grand Canyon. Are you interested? And but we can't take you there. <laughs> um, and it was done from a really um, protective kind of um, understanding of um, our roles with different things. There's certain pilgrimages that we take that it is only meant for the people that are are, are initiated into those societies um, and these groups. So with the Grand Canyon, like the the up upper parts of it definitely, um, you know, is available because it is a national park area, but some of the more sensitive areas, we know that there's a lot of power in those places. Um, and it's being us the guided by a lot of our elders to say, you know, be careful. Uh, these sites might be, um, you know, you may have to focus you have to, a lot of these energies. I remember I've taken a couple of river trips since then. And one of the things, uh, you know, detaches you from your family and you know I had young daughters at the time and you know my focus sometimes was on them like I wonder how they're doing what they're going on and I remember one morning uh, what snapped me back into reality of where I was at and what I need to focus on was uh, trying to put on my shoes that <laughs> sounds like a simple task um, but in my shoes were scorpions um, I put on my right shoe and I didn't know there was one in there uh, but something told me to check my left shoe um, and I checked it very thoroughly and two scorpions fell out. Um, and I was like, wait a minute, I already put on my right shoe. <laughs> so I took off my right shoe and, and shook it out uh, more and one scorpion fell out. And I think it was actually one of the ways that our ancestry shows you in a very gentle way at times, um, a very uh, dangerous <laughs> guided way in times uh, is to focus. You're here for a reason. Um, and again, this challenge for Mallory was a part of that, not to say that she has scorpions in her shoes, but <laughs> give you an idea of how important these places are. Um, and so with that, um, Mallory has a really um, risen as an artist in a lot of different ways. Uh, and she can definitely tell you that, but I think maybe um, going and addressing that as you go along the, the, the balance of male and female uh, when it comes to Zuni history, Zuni culture, Zuni art. Uh, and without further ado, this is Mallory. Hi, everyone. Keshi kotona on doake. Hot Mallory kutao kilechi na hot dona shi kutao dona guawan chale. How's everyone today? Good, good afternoon, actually. <laughs> I'm um, Mallory Kotaki, artist. I am uh, from the Badger clan and child of the Turkey clan. And I am uh, one of the fortunate artists that uh, got to be part of this map art exhibit. I 
uh, was uh, chosen to paint the Grand Canyon. And as <laughs> Curtis mentioned, it was uh, not an easy feat. And so uh, I have the painting here and, you know, further slides. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of break it down for you all and how this process went for me. But um, first and foremost, just, just a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I went to the University of New Mexico for a, a degree in uh, biology with hopes to one day become a physician. So hence the uh, anatomical and scientific art you see here on my little intro slide. Um, I also uh, minored in art, and it was really neat that me and LaVon were in art school at the same time also, so we got to kind of share part of our journeys um, and, you know, be a part of this map exhibit uh, further down the line. Um, but uh, I am a currently a working artist. Uh, I work at the intersection of environmental health and public health and art. So I uh, work with the College of Pharmacy here at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center. I am under the Community Environmental Health Program as the communication and outreach specialist. So I use my art to convey scientific information, health information to native tribes that um, need a little help with uh, either health literacy, uh, but especially to, to inform and uh, you know, educate the people living in and around abandoned uran uranium mines, um, both uh, here in New Mexico and beyond. But um, that's how I use my art. And um, I, you know, for the choosing of me being the map art artist, I, I think it kind of stemmed from a body of work that I did uh, that is now hanging at the Zuni IHS hospital. It is a lot of um, anatomical art pieces all done in chalk pastel. It is my favorite um, uh, thing to use and as well as acrylic. But uh, when I got chosen to do the map art, I handed in a pencil sketch. And, you know, as an artist, I don't quite necessarily know how to go off of my sketches. It's just kind of <laughs> the way I am as an artist. I have an extremely difficult time replicating what I put down, um, even tracing things I drew myself. It's really difficult for me. Um, so uh, when you go to the next slide and I start talking about my my painting for the Grand Canyon, I actually chose to do it in oils. And that kind of bit me in the butt towards the end <laughs> because I was definitely not I guess you can say fluent in oil painting um, as much as that was the only kind of painting I was taught in art school. But there was something about it that just did not give me the chance to kind of layer the way that I normally do as an artist. And LaVon mentioned it that there's so many going on, things going on within this discussion on a, a certain area that you just you just want to put everything there. And that was one of my difficulties. I, I didn't know how to piece it together without kind of creating a sort of a, a collage. I didn't want to, I didn't want to make it look like one. And so I just kind of went with the starting point of the Grand Canyon, uh, specifically chosen to paint the um, landmarks from Zuni to Ribbon Falls. And so um, on the next slide, uh, you can see that the the first, you know, part that I really focused on was because, you know, we consider the Ribbon Falls area our place of emergence in our creation story. And so I really focused heavily on this part. One reason is because, I mean, not only did I have great pictures from <laughs> Curtis and uh, my father who went on these trips with them, and just that uh, verbal knowledge that they had uh, coming back from their trip. But I also, you know, just really hold really dear to me, like these creation stories and our um, oral histories of our migration from the Grand Canyon area to Zuni Pueblo, current day Zuni Pueblo, Halon uh, And just knowing these and hearing it in prayer 
and hearing my father and my maternal grandfather at the dinner table every night, just, you know, going back and forth, sharing this traditional knowledge with us. And, you know, they both have uh, traditional roles in Zuni. Um, so I was raised very traditionally. My father is part of the Kiva Society where he has leadership in one of the six Kivas we have. Um, my grandfather, who passed away in 2012 was the leader of the Red Ant Medicine Fraternity um, during his lifetime. So I had both um, kind of sides of the spectrum of our religious society um, growing up, both the medicine and both the Kiva. Um, and, and, you know, uh, we women also have our duties and in, in the village as well. We have things that we are responsible for. Um, for example, this year, I have a major role in our clan system as we have um, a leadership role in the Badger clan. We are the main um, members, the main ladies who are in charge this year for the Badger clan. So there's things that we do. Um, and uh, as my dad would say it, uh, we keep the wheels moving in the village and hearing just growing up being told you guys are in charge you guys you know make the day-to-day -day happen um you are important you are givers of life um therefore there are things that you know we're you know we're not oppressed i don't want to say that we are not granted these um opportunities that the men would have but we are considered special to where any type of let's say dangerous situations grueling situations um we are protected from because you know as my father would say you're way far too important for this village to you know be um you know in in areas that hold such you know dangerous power um you're a life giver um and he said, like, what, what would the village be without the women? And so uh, we, every person I've ever talked to always has, you know, this sense of giving, you know, and acknowledging the role that women have and the leadership that we also have within our community. Um, so when the day that uh, Curtis called me and he kind of, you know, sheepishly said, you know, you know, we're all going to the Grand Canyon and we're all going to go see this and that artists are going with us. Unfortunately, we can't take you very sorry. And I said, oh, you know, have fun. Make sure you take pictures for me, though. But I, you know, I had no qualms and in, <laughs> in uh, not being able to go because I, I knew my role. I grew up this way and I don't. Um, I never felt that sense of oppression that I couldn't. Uh, I lived through these experiences through the men in our community. And you, you know, we we held sort of vigil when they were gone. We every time our men go on migrations, there's you know things we do at, at home to ensure that their journeys are safe as well. So we're we're pretty much there in spirit all the time. And um, so that focus on you know, my role as a woman just kind of heightened <laughs> my need to portray as much as this oral history as I could in these paintings. And so seeing this, you know, just an immense amount of information just in this one little area of the Ribbon Falls and our creation story, you could see the people emerging from the last branch of the reed coming from the underground worlds that we emerged from and the different faces on the wall and the the um the you know the image right there on the bottom was sent to me by uh Octavius um Sialtua. it is uh it this image uh painted in red hematite is in the grand canyon and it took several trips to to kind of see what it actually was because there are times where this canyon area was flooded and you couldn't really see the entire painting but he was fortunate to, to get a snapshot when the full image was uh, not submerged in water and we could see that it was depicting the same exact stories we tell every day in prayer and in chant that this is how we came about. This is where we came from. 
And so that it's just really surreal to see this and that to know that Curtis and Levon and others were able to go to such place of power that I said, man, I really, I really have it cut out for me to, to create. And so um, on the next pages, um, I show that, you know, there are parts that connect us to the Grand Canyon and not, you know, um, because we migrated from there and we, you know, kind of went across that whole Colorado plateau area from, you know, the Grand Canyon area to the Flagstaff. I incorporated um, the San Francisco peaks, which is, is what we call it in Zuni. Um, along the way, we have an area significant to the Medicine Society called um, Tenatzalima, and it's uh, Woodruff Butte near Holbrook, and which currently, I believe, no longer exists, um, if I'm correct, due to mining in that area, um, which is very unfortunate, but I'm glad we have it captured. I have photos that I kind of went off of. Um, and, you know, hearing from my grandfather the significance of this place and the, the medicine that comes from here and what it's used for in the village. Um, I also wanted to make sure that, you know, there were symbology, you know, as, as Curtis had mentioned, there, there, there were things that we could depict and we couldn't. But on top of that, as a, as a female, there are certain imagery I can't pre um, include. Um, you hear of the the symbol from other tribes, uh, Avanu, the serpent, the water serpent in Zuni. Uh, uh, we we also have one that I actually um, am not allowed to portray. I'm not allowed to paint, and so there are there are images that I I don't say I I'm like uh, that I can't or I don't you know use that as a reason not to continue portraying certain parts of our culture, but I use pottery designs because in um, a book by Ruth Bunzel, uh, there was a, a, a lady from Zuni she uh, interviewed in the late 1800s and she said, you know, tell me about why you're a paint, uh, a potter, potter maker, why, why you make pottery, what do these designs mean? And she had like the most perfect answer and she said, because I can't participate in the Kiva, because I can't paint or draw um, these religious figures. Um, or make prayer sticks. I add my prayer in pottery and I make sure that these symbols match what the men do in the kiva and that these symbols of uh, blessings, asking for rain or moisture, asking for good health, long, long life, um, and uh, different things like that. Like, I really took that to heart. So what made it hard for me uh, using oils was I couldn't layer that much of these pottery designs on there, but I tried as best as I could. Um, I like the symbology of um, using, you know, that umbilical connection to the Grand Canyon by using the Colorado River, the little Colorado that goes through Zuni, um, the Zuni River. And so using that just kind of really instills the fact that we are still connected to this place to this day, our, our, our um, prayers and things that we ask for in life, we send in that direction. You know, um, there are so many instances where you hear these areas being called off and named in in our prayers and chants. And so, um, one of which is a part of our migration story. You'll hear the um, uh, and and why we call Zuni the middle place is because among uh, during our migration. When we were looking for the middle place, we had the assistance of uh, this large water strider that came during the flood and put its heart down where the center of the world would be. And therefore, that is where we made our home um, today. Halon Itiwana, Gan Astepan Iken, and Shiwinaya is what you know I would hear. And that is, you know, the heart of the water strider is where Zuni is. And so I, I put that little figurine there and it looks like something from War of the Worlds, but it's, it is a water strider. <laughs> um, and on the next page, um, I just kind of, you know, want to say that, you know, this map art project, although it was one of the most difficult paintings I've ever done, and just like Levon has said, it's very uh, committee focused. So like, you know, there are things we're told to put in there and things we're allowed to 
and you know but we're still allowed to have that uh you know sense of um retrospect of us as as a younger generation to to add what we can and what we know and this type of i guess i i want to call it a you know learning experience as if you know our um resource mentors and other artists kind of helped guide me to be the artist i am today it definitely gave me experience on how to fill out an RFP and how to, you know, uh, fill out applications to other things uh, as an artist. Because at that time that I did this art piece, I was about towards the end of my college career and it was getting really real. Like, all right, what are you going to do? Your medical school's coming up. Uh, are you going to go that route? But, you know, art sounds so much more fun and relaxing. And I decided to take the art route um, for now. And it has really given me a lot of uh, doors that have opened for me uh, immediately after the map art project, knowing how that I could fill out an RFP and that I had the um, support from uh, Zcrat. Um, that would be also the voting committee for an upcoming mural at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center here in Albuquerque. I, I went for it and I very surprisingly <laughs> got it. And so in 2010, there was a large scale mural that was put up um, by me and, you know, under the um, mentorship of the Cultural Center, the museum, and of course my uh, family and other elders and that just, you know, even more so kept going. As I had mentioned, I do work in the intersection of science and art, uh, using my art to help explain uh, difficult things. It's not always, you know, about, you know, body parts and health issues, but things that we can't really convey like mental health. Uh, very much recently, the coronavirus pandemic there's a lot of material that were made, and I feel like artists, we as artists, had a really giant calling during that time. Um, it, it, it really nailed in that importance of uh, visualization of different things for us. And as artists, like, we're able to do that. And if you have that traditional backing, I mean, there it's endless what we could do. So... Uh, again, I worked with Curtis not too long ago at the end of 2020. Um, we were uh, fortunate to be selected to um, represent uh, Native American Heritage Month by uh, creating a Google Doodle um, on the uh, life and um, memory of the late Wewa, who was a Zuni Pueblo member who uh, was born male but uh, lived female. And that came again full circle for uh, me and Curtis to be in a position again to talk about and address, you know, our uh, gender roles in in our society and how it differs from Western society and the different um, things that, you know, we wanted to share with the general public. This went live on the first day of Native American Heritage Month, which was uh, November 1st. And it is interactive. It's a weaving game. You can still go and find it on the Google Doodles page. But that in itself was just a great opportunity, great journey. Very most recently, I've landed um, a neat thing, uh, another poster contest that I didn't know was eventually the image was going to end up uh, here. But um, I was fortunate to have this image put alongside the Grounded in Clay exhibit, which is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, it had just opened uh, last week on July 14th, and it is on through June 2024. But this painting here at the bottom corner with the corn and the sun face uh, is projected onto the wall as a giant news, uh, like a wallpaper, and it is the welcoming piece alongside another artist as the welcoming piece for the Grounded in Clay exhibit, which is a tribally curated uh, pottery show. And um, great exhibit, if you're out there, please go see it. But this painting also, once again, just really comes full circle to the journey I've had since uh, working with the map art that, you know, culture and heritage and language is very important and that it is something that we want 
to share, especially with our younger generations, and to be able to also find these connections we have amongst one another. We have um, different cultures represented in this poster, both from the southern border, the northern border, where in our in, in our ancestors' days were not borders at all. And so this uh, inclusion uh, of my art in the map art has definitely <laughs> fruited well. And thank you. Thank you for having me. Just, you know, wonderful and congratulations um, on the show that's just opened and both of you, um, your work is just really, really wonderful um, and lots of just beautiful details. Um, you see I'm checking the chat, um, just a lot of comments about um, that, just how beautiful and, and wonderful to hear about your process in creating your, your, your art. Um, as a question I have um, for you, Mallory, is um, are you, do you feel inspired to paint any other places um, that would otherwise be considered traditionally male spaces? And, and when you do, do you, do you envision kind of putting yourself into those places or is it, um, you know, kind of, or are you keeping yourself separate? I definitely put myself there in the sense that because we're still part of ceremony in Zuni at home, we're very much participants of it. Um, and so that, you know, our, our prayers and our, you know, the, the way we talk to our ancestors carries that way. And so, like, my voice is there. I feel that it is. And I do have a, a place and somewhere will I, I won't be able to, you know, visit until I'm part of that spirit world one day. But to me, it's like honoring these areas, these place making powers. I mean, the uh, mural that I made was just that very similar issue where how do you pr portray language without and how do you portray uh, culture without divulging too much and all the esoteric knowledge that we have as, as Zuni people. Um, there's been place things that, I mean, I do get challenged a lot by other artists um, who aren't from Zuni that, you know, oh, you know, someone like Pablita Velarde was such a, you know, she broke the glass ceiling and things like that. And I, and I love, I mean, I love her art and I also respect my culture so much that I would not go that same route because um, she was known for actually painting our Shatlako deity. Um, she is a woman, she was not part of Akiva, so that was actually really taboo. And those that don't understand our culture constantly ask that question, say, well, aren't you gonna do the same? It's not the same anymore. And I said, it still is right here. It still very much is living a living uh, culture and community to where I, it's not necessarily being told to stay in your lane. I am on the same lane. It's just a matter of what's respectable and what's honorable. And so I definitely still have ways in which I, I can portray a lot of our culture, but I use what I had just mentioned, the pottery designs and colors. There's a really specific color from Zuni that I actually found in a, in a graffiti, uh, a uh, spray paint store that just amazed me. It's called Zuni Green. It is that turquoise. You probably see it behind me. Um, that's probably the closest I will ever get because that color was created because the the owner got to visit one of our ceremonies and saw our our rain dance and that color of the rain dance was very prominent and said so, like that's. That is a very Zuni color, and I and I agree because I I make that color myself all the time. But to see that on a spray can called Zuni Green, I I use it a lot, and to me it also represents these things in our culture that we don't have to paint, but we know it's there, and that we're honoring it and acknowledging it in the ways that we can. And Levi, I guess a question for you. I have uh, your your paintings are so intricate with all the 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 um, vignettes within. Are you 
composing the vignettes and then working them together or do you, is it that you you have this greater story and then select the vignettes of how they might tell the story throughout the painting i think it's a combination of both <clears throat> it's interesting to work from imagery that you already know personally how you want to convey the space and then places that you have not been and you're working off of only flat two-dimensional photographs. Um, so the task for me was to, um, to compose something that uh, I could work with and that I understood. And I, I used this process of layering. <clears throat> well, how I would do is I would draw the drawing what I wanted and then I would take it to FedEx or Kinko's and then size it to where I wanted it to be. And then from there, I would compose the rest of the image. And some places uh, proposed more of a challenge and that just came uh, through, os through creative osmosis, just the, the, the creative process created the avenue for it to <clears throat> seamlessly look like it fit there all the time. And I think uh, as artists, we kind of do that to make it look easy and simple, but um, it takes years and years to, um, I don't know, hone your craft and make it look like it, it looks easy, I guess. Um, I, lo I love uh, going from one medium to the next and sometimes um, the, the cross wiring between painting and uh, something else comes into play, but um, in terms of uh, understanding, understanding how the composition process um, began, <clears throat> that started with a, a professor of mine at the University of New Mexico. His name was um, Michael Cook. I'm sure Mallory probably knows of Michael Cook. He was a really uh, influential professor for me. Um, he constantly challenging me and asking reasons why I'm doing the things I do, which for the most part, I don't even know it at the time. <clears throat> but that's interesting to uh, see that that conversation I had with him came through in the Mapwalk project. And Chris, do you have any other questions you wanted to add? No, I think uh, if there's any other questions uh, yeah. that we can to go now. Uh, I guess are you are for both of you? Um, what are some projects that are coming up that you're looking forward to? Um, and in in what ways has the SUNY Map Art Project. How is it, con you know, continuing to influence your um, upcoming work? Oh well, do you mind if I go first, Mallory? Go ahead. Oh, um, the Map Art, the Map Art Project has given me an opportunity to be able to put uh, my what I had learned in art school to work. I guess you would say, <clears throat> and then also an opportunity to have my foot in the door in terms of the art world. Um, I think uh, the, having the map art project uh, be a part of my resume um, kind of had shown to, I don't know, I've applied for, you know, for grants ever since. And it just seems like um, I would get more of a response after my participation with the map art project. So that definitely helped me further my career. And what I have now, um, I'm planning to go to graduate school. And so learning how to do that is in a task in itself. And like I've always said before, uh, I've struggled as an artist. So I, I used to, I used uh, my dual career as a wildland firefighter to fund my artistic aspirations. So summer right now i'm a firefighter um which is great because it's it's both strenuous uh, 
strenuously physically demanding, <clears throat> but I often have to use my my spiritual and I don't know this understanding of how my world view affects my my well being and my health and the places that we go is often on the landscape. And so I'm often constantly evaluating, you know, the presence of our people on the landscape. Uh, and then just kind of sending the message, you know, carrying the message of the map art or the presence of what I think we as uh, Zuni people find to be important to, to let people know that we do have our presence here on the land still. And then it's important to acknowledge um, certain things whether we like it or not, I think sometimes that becomes a hot button issue when you're talking about land, land rights and land use, obviously. Um, but it's also something that feeds my creative, the creative portions of like how I want to communicate in, through my artwork. And um, so it helps me there. And other, other than that, then that's what I'm up against. So thank you. So right now, I actually have a, a mural exhibit also at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. I was fortunate to be given uh, the artist circle space, um, which Lavon actually it was a predecessor of mine where he had that space before. Yeah. Um, I uh, re was notified yesterday that we are extending it till decent uh, till January actually of next year. So it'll be. Uh, pretty much a six long month exhibit or normally it's about three, um, but it is a, uh, a group project with, um, a Diné artist. Uh, she is a calligrapher as well as two, uh, poets who, I mean, I'm, I dove into a, a different kind of a genre of create, not, not genre, but a different style of creating art, creating art to poetry and then poets creating, uh, poems from my art and it just became this giant mural project which now became a giant story on uh, pollinators and healing so that show is going to be uh, kind of refreshed in October um, it is still going to be uh, on display but we're going to kind of add a different twist in it probably make it more uh, reflective of the fall season but that really you know, being in the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, although it is jointly um, owned and managed by all 19 Pueblos, it still is like a complete absolute honor to be there anytime that they ask of me. And so being there and, and the, the fact that I was part of the map art project just gave me a really, you know, big, you know, just, I don't know, it really instilled to me the idea of the power of place. And so all these place making uh, areas in our culture and our oral history, um, I really consider that when I start creating um, paintings and you know where, where my um, inspirations are coming from, but something as large as a mural um, in this artist space, it is a circle room. It has never been painted on before. Usually you hang um, artwork there, but we're actually, we have murals there. And so it's just really, you know, I carry that with me now since the map art project, since working with Z Crete members and getting that just knowledge from elders and community members uh, who had, you know, high importance within our community, the society, um, that teaching that they gave us like i'll always carry that there's a lot of things i learned from that and just having confidence now um i used to be really squirrel squirrelish <laughs> around the, the greats like you know the late uh rani kachani the late Duane dishta the late alex Siautiwa, who i grew up next door to and just being in their presence was just always awe admiring and i thought i could never or live up to their their greatness, but to be considered their colleague in my you know current life now in the through through the levels that I've stepped up to and being given that honor by the late Ronnie Kachani during a 
conversation in Las Cruces that we went to, just like his blessing to continue forward and that I was doing good and to keep carrying that was just really, really emotional for me. Like I get to be, I got given that, um, that go ahead because I'm doing good. Yeah. Very honored. Very, very honored. So that's, I'll always carry that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and we are at time. So I, I do want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. We apologize for the um, extreme technical difficulties that we had today. Uh, we're looking into seeing what happened and how we can fix it before our August program. Our next program will be um, a screening of the film Then, Now, and Forever, Zuni in the Grand Canyon. And our speaker will be Octavia Sotewa, a Zuni artist, elder, and cultural advisor. And we hope that you all stay safe and stay cool. And we will see you in August. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Rams. Bye bye.